Welcome to Crossbridge Community Church online campus. It is so good to be back with you. I was on vacation the last two weeks and I missed you. I missed communicating with you and just being able to worship with you. Today we are continuing in To Be Continued. Pastor Keith is going to bring us part three and it is called Keep Knowing. So get your notebook out, get your app out ready to take notes. I know that God is going to speak to you in the next few minutes. Welcome to Crossbridge. Welcome those of you who are joining us online. We're going to worship together. Let's stand and let's sing this song of who our God is and what he does for us. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. praise and treasures that fade are never enough then you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love sing oh there's nothing Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you, Jesus. I'm not afraid to show you my My failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Amen. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Everybody lift your voices, sing this out together. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. Thank you, Jesus. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the You're the only one who 
sing it out. Cause it's nothing better than you are. There's nothing better than you are. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. Thank you. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the you so glad that we serve a God who can turn a grave into a garden, a God of resurrection. Would you just be ready to worship him today? You can be seated for just a few moments. I'm Pastor Sherry. I'm one of the staff pastors here. It's good to have you here, whether this is your 51st year of coming to Crossbridge or this is your first time. We just want to say welcome. We do have a gift for you if this is your first time here out at the coffee bar. We just love to get to know you a little bit at the end of the service. So we like to have fun at Crossbridge and we've had fun just singing and uh, we have an announcement for you that sounds like a whole lot of fun. When I was growing up, I was not a very athletic, but my mother made me wear orthopedic shoes. So the first time in my life, I could kick a ball really far because these shoes were awful. They were awful, but they were heavy, and it helped me kick. And so there's going to be a kickball tournament. No, I am not participating, so you're okay. A kickball tournament July 31st from 3 to 6 p.m. at Baker Lake. And Rob Clydesdale, our Youth um, United Minister, director at Peru is going to organize this, and he wants it to be an intergenerational event. So if you love kickball, if you want to just come and cheer, you need to be there. So mark your calendar, July 31st. Thank you so very much for bringing jelly to Games and Grubs, both at our Peru campus and our Ottawa campus. We just appreciate how you help us feed children and families all over the Illinois Valley. And thank you for how you worship through giving. If you came prepared to give today, we do have boxes on the back wall. You can give online or you can give through our app, but we just want to thank you for the many ways that you worship our God through giving. You know, there's a story that just kind of kept going over in my head uh, this week, and it's the story of Lazarus. And it talks about Lazarus being one of Jesus' very, very good friends. And Mary and Martha were really good friends with Lazarus. But Lazarus died. But when Jesus saw Martha after Lazarus had died, she said these words that we find in the Gospel of John. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. We're going to continue to worship. We're going to continue to lift our voices in song because we believe in the power of Jesus Christ, not only to make gardens out of graves, but to give us resurrection hope. Would you stand if you're able and sing with us? Of Jesus, the wash is white as snow. I believe in the power of the gospel, still makes the broken whole. I believe 
that the curse of sin was broken when they rolled away the stone. I believe, I believe, I believe. As I bow before you, Lord, I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. And no matter where I go, and no matter where I've been, I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. I believe that the walls will start falling when we fall down on our knees. I believe that the lame will go walking and the blind are gonna see. I believe that the gates of hell will tremble when the church begins to sing. I believe, I believe, I believe. As I bow before you, Lord, I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. No matter where I go and no matter where I've been, I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. Sing it to the daughters, sing it to the sons. To every generation, look at what the Lord has done. Sing it to the darkness, and the light has come. Sing it to the nations, look at what the Lord has done. Sing it to the daughters, oh, sing it to the sons. To every generation. Look at what the Lord has done. Sing it to the darkness, and the light has come. Sing it to the nations. Look at what the Lord has done. Look at what the Lord has done. As I bow before you, Lord, I will in confidence I will see your goodness Lord in the land I'm living in and no matter where I go and no matter where I've been I will see your goodness Lord in the land I'm living in as I bow before you Lord I will rise in confidence I will see in the land I'm living in And no matter where I go And no matter where I've been I will see your goodness, Lord In the land I'm living in Amen. Yeah, give him praise. I love the promises that God gives us in those words, that we will see his goodness. And I love that word confidence. We have been singing songs of hope today. And I want to share with you a scripture out of Romans that says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I love that scripture because of the word the. The source of hope. Not a source of hope. He is the source of hope. And when we trust in him, he promises to fill us completely with joy and peace. So I just want to challenge you today as we continue to worship to reclaim your hope today, to get your hopes up in Jesus because he is faithful and he has proven time and time again to be faithful. Let's continue to sing. How 
together again.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that word hope today. We thank you for the hope that can be found when we place our trust in you. We thank you for being a God that is faithful to keep his promises, God. And Lord, I pray that you would just look upon us today, look into our hearts and our souls and speak into us today. As we open ourselves to you, Lord, you know exactly what we need to hear. And so I pray, Father, that as, as we begin to continue worshiping through hearing your, your word through the Holy Scriptures, Lord, that what we hear would take root in our hearts today, that when we would walk out of these doors, we would be changed people, a people of hope, a people of confident hope in you. We thank you that that is the God that you are. We pray all of this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. I don't know about you, but I sure am glad I came today, huh? Yeah, right? Let's celebrate that. Man. Yeah, we're here together again. And let me just say from the very beginning, uh, there is no place I would rather be right now than right here with all you amazing, incredible Crossbridgers. That's right. Peru crew, I love you. You're my people, Peru crew. I'm here with you. All of you joining us online, thanks for making your way to the worldwide interwebs and joining us for service. Hey, it's a great weekend, and I want to invite you to do something. Turn to those around you, wherever you are, who's ever joining you on the worldwide interweb or right there in Peru. Just wish them a happy weekend. Wish your neighbors a happy weekend. I like it. So we're in this series called To Be Continued, and for those of you who maybe missed a couple weeks or if slept since last time we gathered together. Let me just give you a little bit of a refresher. We've been going through this understanding as we've dove into God's Word together that each of us lives a story. Each of us in our lives is telling a story. And what we discovered is in each of our lives, this story has a grand author who desires to write the chapters of your story and my story. And this God who loves us, who cares for us, who has plans and purposes for us, says that this work that he has started, he wants to continue to do and write the chapters of your story in the days yet to come. We know this because it's a part of our theme verse for this entire series, Philippians 1, 6, and here's what it says. And I am certain that God who began the good work in you will continue his work until it is finally finished. You see, my friends, you're not finished yet, (laughs) that your life is a to-be-continued story as well, and that God says the work that I've started in you is going to be that work I'm going to continue to do in each and every one of you. And our heart, our hope and prayer for each and every one of you is you'll say yes to the author, and that as he continues to write your story, that you'll say, what's next, Lord? I want to follow where you lead and where you want to go. So, so far in our series, we've talked about to-be-continued. We want to keep going. Last week, we talked about keep growing. Maybe you remember the little walker and then the trike and the bicycle and steering wheel. Some of you mentioned to me, I kind of shocked you a little bit when I brought the walker out. You weren't expecting that, but thanks for going along with me. But today, I want to talk to you about keep knowing. Keep knowing. You see, there are just certain things in life you really should know, aren't there? People have probably come up to you and said, you should really know that. And maybe they've told you a few things that you didn't know you should know, but now you know you should know it. Not confusing at all, right? But I was thinking about that as I was getting ready for this message, and I came across an interesting article titled, 54 Things That Every Person Should Know. I'm not going to share all 54 of them with you, but I wanted to share at least a few with you today. Uh, Like this one, number one, you should know how to make a fire without using any matches. I'm already 0 for 1, okay? I don't know that. Maybe you're better at this than I am, but I don't know how to do that. This next one I do know how to do. It said everyone should know how to parallel park. I think that was the worst part of the driving test. Can I get an amen? A parallel park? Yes, I don't get it. Why parallel park when you can just keep driving around the block until something opens up? Just kidding. 
Uh, this next one I thought was pretty intriguing. You really should know how to do CPR. Now, just for fun, how many of you here today know how to do CPR? Raise your hand. Wow, anyone want to move spots now, right? Like, I want to sit next to them. Because it's not that I want anything to happen, but if something is going to happen, I want to be sitting next to them. I'm going to feel a little more comfort. Hopefully those of you joining us online, you have someone around you that knows CPR as well in Peru. But this last one I thought was pretty intriguing. Brought back a lot of memories. Everyone should know how to swim. Now, um, for all of you who do know how to swim, I think there are two primary schools of teaching when it comes to swimming. The first one is this one where you have a really nice instructor who gets this little paddle board and lovingly guides you along the way. That's school number one. There's also school number two. It's this. This is what I call the you'll figure it out approach, okay? How many of you are like me and had a father who employed the you'll figure it out approach? Anyone? We're going to form a support group afterwards. You're all invited to be a part of it with me. Just a handful of things that you can know. And in the world we're living in, there are always new things, new bits of information that are happening, ways and things that we can continue to learn and continue to know. But there's one thing that we're going to talk about today, a truth from God's message for us that I believe is better than them all. A point of knowledge, something that we can learn that I believe will bring us a a hope that we just sang about, a hope that nothing in this world can compare to, can bring us a peace and a comfort that maybe you've never ever experienced before. Now, let me just ask you something. Does a little more peace and comfort and hope in your life sound like a good thing for anyone else here today? I've yet to run into many people who say, Keith, I just couldn't handle any more hope in my life. I'm just filled with hope to the brim. Or somebody said, Keith, if I had any more peace, I'd actually be anxious about how much peace I'm having. Hope and peace and comfort is one of those things that many of us strive for. And I've got good news for you today. The good news shares with us this source of hope, something that we can know, that we can know, that we can know, and in our minds, in our hearts, our souls, and our spirits that brings about that peace and hope and comfort that I just told you about. Hey, however you're reading God's message today, turn with me to where we picked off last week. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, beginning with verse 12. And remember, we're note takers, at least I pray you are, so grab your app, your Crossbridge app, if you downloaded it last week. You've got the notes feature there, paper and a pen, uh, anything that you need to do to take notes, because you want to make sure to receive the message that God has for you today as he speaks through his word and through his Holy Spirit. So Philippians chapter 1, beginning with verse 12, would you please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word today. This is what God's message says to us. And I want you to know, (laughs) I want you to know this, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. It's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. Those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, and tending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message of, about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice. And I will continue to rejoice. For I know that as you pray for me and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your word. It's alive and active. Would you do what only you can do in this place? Holy Spirit, would you flood us into overflowing with your presence, convict, encourage, do whatever it is that you need to do so that when we leave here today, none of us leave the same as when we came in, but know that we've encountered the living God in our midst. We ask it all in your name, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I need to take a moment and give a little bit of a warning here, okay? I need to talk about something that can be an emotionally volatile topic, but it's important for the message. So I'm going to share something with you in just a moment, and it's going to cause some of you to emotionally have a response. Some of you may be on one of the spectrum where you're going to cheer, yeah, 
Others of you, you're going to want to cry. Some of you are going to want to rejoice, and others of you are going to want to boo. And so I'm hoping you're wondering, what is this especially emotion response topic that you're going to share with us, Pastor Keith? Thank you for hypothetically asking that. Um, it's called college football, everyone. All right. Are you ready for some football? And they're like, yes. And others are like, no. It sits around the topic, um, who do we cheer for here? I'm still new. Are, do we cheer for Illinois? Do we cheer for Northwestern? Oh, man, we got a lot. of All of it, Nazarene University, can we all agree to that one for a minute? Okay. Hey, online, do me a favor. Tell us in the chat who it is that you're cheering for college football-wise. Um, any Notre Dame fans here today? Strong, huh? Strong, but a quiet minority here. But way to be brave, way to be strong and courageous. I personally am not a a fan of Notre Dame football. Don't hold that against me. But there is something I love about the fighting Irish program. You know what it is? It's this guy, Rudy. Uh, Now, how many of you have seen this classic, iconic film before? Good, 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 good. For those of you who are unaware of it, uh, let me give you a slight recap. But if you're planning on watching it, uh, take a second and plug your ears for the next few moments, okay? But you have to unplug them a little later. The the story's about this guy named Rudy. (laughs) Great name for a movie, right? Um, And he wants nothing more than to play football for Notre Dame. Here's the problem. (laughs) He's a little too small. He's 5'6", he's not strong enough, he's not quite good enough, so he keeps running into roadblocks and he can't get to that spot, that dream destination that he desires. But he won't give up. He keeps scratching and clawing and fighting his way to get on the team. And finally, one day, the coach looks to him and gives him a spot on the team. Sort of. For two years, he's nothing more than a glorified tackling dummy. But Rudy will not stop pursuing this dream. So he keeps showing up and doing the drills and keep keep on keeping on. And finally, in 1975, this iconic game takes place between Notre Dame and Georgia Tech. And the coach looks at Rudy and he says, Rudy, the day is coming. You can dress for this game. Rudy's excited, as you can imagine. But the game continues to go on, and Rudy hasn't seen any playing time yet until the very end of the game where Rudy's coach looks at him and says, Rudy, you're in. He's in for a whopping 27 seconds. Wow, but he makes the most of these 27 seconds, and he has an incredible tackle on a kickoff return, and then when he's playing defense, he actually sacks the quarterback, and time runs out in the game, and this iconic part of the movie takes place, where all of Rudy's fellow teammates hoist him up on their shoulders and triumphantly carry him off the field. Oh, it's amazing. It's an ending that's made even the hardest of men will shed a tear and blame it on allergies, okay? Okay. But in that moment, Rudy, which is based on a true story, is so very moving to me. And I find it so inspiring, not because of the incredible ending, as wonderful as it is. It inspires me, it moves me, because of what it took to get to that ending. (laughs) You see, it inspires me because of all the challenges that had to be conquered, all the obstacles that had to be overcome, what made the struggle so and intense for him is what made the victory even that much sweeter. (laughs) Think about it in your life. For those people who you may look at as inspirations, you look to as sources of hope, they're probably not those people who just kind of said, life's been kind of easy for me, you know? I've always had everything I've ever needed, never really ran into any struggles or challenges, and you should just be just like me. (laughs) Yeah, right. Those who inspire us are usually those ones who have challenges and obstacles and problems and pain, but just like Rudy, never give up. They keep on keeping on. They keep fighting. They keep believing. They keep persevering. (laughs) There's another guy we heard about today in God's message who knows a thing or two about problems, but his problems don't have to do with getting cut from the football team he dreams to play for. His problems are what I call next level problems. And his name is Paul. He's the one that God inspired, that God gave the words to, to write this incredible letter that we dove into today. And Paul's problems are are pretty intense. 
And you start hearing about them right here in verse 12. So I want you to pay special attention to this here. What it says in Philippians 1.12. Throw that verse up there for me if you'd be so kind. He says this, and I want you to, what? I want you to know, we're going to keep knowing, that dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here. Now that may not mean anything to you yet, unless you know what here is and what here refers to. Here is prison, the big house, it's jail. And when we think about this, we can imagine Paul writing these letters from a jail cell. (laughs) And this is not like a regular jail cell like we have today in America. It's not like a a mattress or a pad that you have in your own little special bathroom area in, in the spot. But Rather, this is one of those things that's more like a dungeon, if we can imagine it. But I put a picture up of what we believe might have been something like Paul's uh, jail cell back in the day. It looked a little something like this. So if you can imagine, that is where Paul is. Oftentimes, there's very little light, not a lot of ventilation, sometimes standing in cold and damp spaces, standing water. And do you guys notice the bathroom facility there? I didn't either. <laughs> It was all around you, the human waste just there. I mean, talk about some problems that Paul experiences there. But it's not just the physical problems that Paul deals with. It's also all the problems that come with the physical trouble and pain. It's the isolation. It's the loneliness. It's the despair. (laughs) If we're not careful, sometimes we can look at these passages, these messages that we read and kind of think, boy, this must be Paul just chilling out on the beach. Maybe in a hammock saying, hey, let's write the Bible. This will be fun. That's not what Paul is doing here. Paul knows a thing or two about problems, about challenges, both physical and emotional and spiritual. Hey, since we're on the topic, many of us know a thing or two about pain and struggles and challenges, don't we? Hey, let's get real this day, okay? Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Um, I'm going to ask you to audience participation just for a moment. How many of you would be willing to admit that you have at least one problem in your life or know where you can find one? Good. How many of you are sitting next to someone that looks like they have a problem? <laughs> How many of you are sitting next to your... No, don't, really, don't raise your hand on that one. That's good. Uh, well, that's a, a message for another day. Hey, here's what I invite you to do. Remember, we're note takers here. Grab your app, grab your notes. I want you to do this. I want you to think about some of the problems, the pains, the struggles, the concerns that you have in your life right now, and I want you to start writing those down, okay? I'm serious, right now. Uh, Write it on your notes, write it on your app, write it on your hand, write it on your neighbor's hand. I don't care, just write them down. Those things that make you a little bit nervous, Uh, those things that maybe keep you up at night, Those things that make you maybe silently wonder, am I going to make it through this thing? Those are the types of things I want you to write down. Maybe for you, it's a a marriage struggle or an infertility, a financial situation, a, a health scare, or a secret addiction that no one really knows about. Hey, and I'm giving you free reign for the rest of our time together as we dive into God's Word in this message. Anything that comes to mind that's a pain or a challenge or an obstacle in your life, I want you to write this down. And I know for some of you, you're kind of hesitant. You don't want to do this because you say, Keith, just you talking about it is stressing me out. I mean, earlier you were talking about peace and hope and comfort. I ain't there yet, man. So what are you doing? I'm asking you to trust me. Take a bold step of courage today, and and here's the reason why. I believe that God has peace for you. I believe He has hope for you. But let me make sure you hear this. To know the healing, first you got to know the hurt. And to experience the victory, first you got to name the struggle. So I'm, I'm challenging you right now, even in this moment, this is one of those highly important times. What is it that maybe is the struggle here today, okay? So now that that's in your mind, even if you're not writing it down, I'm willing to bet that in the forefront of your mind, you're thinking about something that is a problem or a challenge or a pain. Now, here's a question I want to ask you. I think it's the question today. What if God had a purpose in that challenge and in that pain? What if the pain wasn't the end? What if there's hope for that seemingly hopeless situation? What if that failure wasn't final? 
If you knew that the struggle didn't end with the struggle, would that change your perspective a little bit? If you knew that you knew that you knew that that pain would produce a breakthrough that would one day change your life, would that bring you a little bit of hope? I sure hope so. Because my friends, I got good news for you. That's exactly what God's word says to us. That in the middle of our problems, in the middle of our pain, that there is a God who is still at work. And some of the most incredible breakthroughs come about through some of the most painful, challenging obstacles in our life. And you can know that he is at work. You can know it more than you know how to change a tire or how to swim. This is the confidence that God gives us. He looks to us and he says, you can know that there's a hope for you. Regardless of how hopeless the situation has seemed like for your life. But of course, it happens in the most interesting way. There's this paradox in the gospel that something that seems so counterintuitive to us is oftentimes the very avenue that God uses to teach us this truth. So I'm going to share something with you straight from God's word that at first is going to cause you to pause. How does God give us this hope? How does he give us this peace in the midst of the pain? I want to explain it to you, but first we got to look at verse 14 of Philippians chapter 1. It says this, and say these underlined words with me, will you? Because of my imprisonment, and because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. Can we back up one slide just for a second? I want you to see that underlined part one more time. Can we just sit with that moment, that, that phrase for a moment? It says, because of my imprisonment. It doesn't say in spite of my imprisonment or despite my jail time. It doesn't say regardless of my incarceration. Most of us would see that makes sense if, if it said that, but Paul says something completely different. It says, because of my problems, because of my pain, because of these challenges and obstacles... God did something amazing. He, the people in my life, in my community that I'm, I'm, I'm walking with, they've gained confidence, and now they boldly speak God's word without fear. What? Isn't that counterintuitive? That God would take a problem and bring a blessing out of it. It doesn't make sense to us. How could prison ever be a good thing? Usually prison and blessings don't go hand in hand, do they? Many of you are not saying, you know what, I really need to be blessed in my life. I think I'll go to prison. It's not usually the case for us, is it? But Paul says, I want to make sure you grasp this. It was precisely because of the prison. That served as the catalyst for a God-directed outcome I never could have possibly dreamed of. He says this, it wouldn't have happened without the struggle. It couldn't have taken place without the pain. My friends, these are what I call because of moments, all right? Because of moments. These are our moments for us when pain and struggle and challenge actually act as a catalyst for a God-directed outcome we never could have imagined. I know this is hard, so I want us to sink, let that sink in for a minute because this is where hope comes from. This is where peace originates. And again, it's so counterintuitive. We think problems is problems, and we think blessings is blessings, and to think that a blessing and a breakthrough would come through the problem sometimes can be such a challenge for us. So I asked the Lord as I was getting ready for this message today, I said, Lord, what's a because of moment in my life where a moment of pain and suffering and and heartache actually became something that you used, became a catalyst for a God-directed breakthrough that I never would have imagined, a God-directed outcome I never could have dreamed of. And one immediately came to mind for me. It's a situation with my mom. Now, many of you don't know me that well yet. I've been here for three weeks not probably best friends yet, but we're going to get there eventually. But one of the things you'll discover about me right away is how blessed I was to have a couple godly parents raising me. And, and they were not perfect, no, not by any means, but they were wonderful godly people who did all that they could to point me towards Jesus. And I'm so thankful for them. And part of my story, if you were to read those first few chapters, would be blessings and encouragement and all kinds of godliness that was taking place. But lately, the chapters that have been written for me and in my life have taken a drastic turn. You see, a couple years ago, my dad died very unexpectedly in his sleep, totally unaware of it, that it was, he was even not doing well. 
no chance to say goodbye, this man who had shaped and molded me in, in ways that few people ever have, and, and I missed him. It was a hard, hard time, but in that same period, my mom went through a very difficult time with dealing with Alzheimer's, and it's a rapidly progressive form of Alzheimer's. Uh, this past couple days, Reagan and I and our kiddos, we went down there because she fell and fractured her pelvis in a couple places, and we were trying to care for her, and we just got back today, and it's, it's one of those moments where the hardest part is to watch someone you love and care for slowly fade away. It's excruciating in a way that I can't properly describe it. And a transition, transition has taken place in our relationship. You see, mom used to be the one that I would go to for answers and comfort and care. And now I've become the person that has come to for answers and comfort and care. And as this journey progresses, the most interesting, counterintuitive thing has ever happened. My love for my mom has, has not decreased in that time. It's actually increased. Even though she can't kiss boo-boos anymore and she can't give wisdom, and many times she can't even put together words in a, in a sentence to pray with me, my love for her hasn't decreased. It's actually increased. And again, I know this sounds counterintuitive, so just trust me on this one. I'm actually able to love my mom in a way that I didn't even know was possible. And here's what I mean. Whether you like it or not, when you're a kid, part of the way that you love your parents, at least I hope you did, I hope you had a good childhood. If not, we're going to talk about that another day. But part of what it is, is you love them so much for a lot of what they do for us. And that's not a bad thing. I hope it's not the only thing. But in the midst of this time, I started to realize something. Even though mom couldn't do any of those things anymore, this light bulb moment came onto me and it reminded me, I don't love my mom for what she can do for me. I love her because of who she is to me. Because she's mom. And I love her because she's mom. And, and that makes her lovable in my eyes. And then I'll never forget, as I'm sitting there on her bedside, and she having a hard time not even realizing or recognizing who I am, it hit me like a ton of bricks. God spoke to me, not in an audible voice, but in a way that is undeniably said, Keith, that's how I love you. I always knew it here, but never really experienced it to that extent here. And it started to flood my soul. No matter if I preach a home run or if I preach a single or an out, <laughs> that that doesn't change his love for me because it's not dependent on what I can do for him. It's because of who I am to him. Can I make sure you hear that today, my friends? It's because of who you are to him. You're his beloved child. You're his creation. And he is your heavenly father. And there's nothing you could say. There's nothing you could do that would ever make him love you any more or less than he does right now. And he was sitting there in the corner of that hospital bed as I was looking at a woman who I love so very much and who couldn't even recognize who I was where it came across loud and clear. Keith, I love you in that deep, didn't even know it was possible kind of way. And even though I wouldn't ever wish this on any person in the world, God used this extremely painful and hard and challenging situation to show me His love in a way I never could have imagined. Not in spite of, but because of. Hey, enough about me. What about you? Oh, I'd rather you talk about you more, Keith, right? This is when you start stepping on to say, hey, you ever experienced any because of moments? What's your because of moments? Some moments where maybe you've looked at it as pain and, and struggle and challenge, but maybe, just maybe, that was the catalyst that served as a God-directed move for an outcome you never would have imagined. Uh, let me prime the pump a little bit. For some of you, it was that challenge that you went through in your family dynamic that pushed you to your knees in prayer and because of that pain, you now know an intimacy with God that you never knew before. For others of you, it was a challenge that took place in your workplace, and you kept getting berated for your faith, and that made you dive deep into God's Word and intimacy into a relationship with Him, and suddenly you knew in a way you never knew before His love for you and the truth that can change your life. For others of you, it was a prodigal son or prodigal daughter, and you thought you knew what love was until that son or daughter wandered away, and and now there's this understanding of God's love for us, maybe like I experienced it too. At first, it's many of these things that appear only as pain and struggle and challenge that if we were just to trust and look long enough, maybe, just maybe, we could see 
of those very things because of those things, we could experience a new depth in our relationship with God and experience His love and His grace for us. And maybe at first He can't see it, but as He look back at it, do you think maybe, just maybe, you could see how God has been at work through all of it? A few more examples. For some of you, it was that infertility. And now, through the blessing of God, maybe you've had your child or you've adopted a child or you've become a foster family or you're a godmother or a godfather. And, and as you look back now, you realize the joy that you feel now in large part is due because of the problem that you had to deal with there. Or for some of you, it was that job loss. And at first it looked like nothing but pain, nothing but struggle, nothing but challenge. But then as you look at it now, you realize that set the stage. Maybe for a job you've got now that's better or one of those situations where you started a business and you can't imagine life without it. For others of you, it is that prodigal son or daughter that I talked about, but you are on the other side. Where when they've returned home, man, you know what God's word means when it says that the father ran and embraced them and just wept and, and smothered them with kisses. It's intriguing, isn't it? But it's in those moments, what at first appears like pain and heartache and sorrow and challenges, uh, it's often because of those things that they serve as a catalyst for God to do something that our minds could never even begin to imagine or comprehend. Uh, maybe saying it like this will help. You never know you need a healer until you're hurt, right? You never know you need a way maker until you need a way made. You never know you need a comforter unless you have something in your life that needs comforting, Right? I know this is, this is hard, but I need us to get this, my friends, because this is where peace and this is where hope comes from. And, and I know that some of you are looking at me, Keith, and you're like, great, wonderful for you, but man, that's not where I am. And I'm kind of on the, the other side. I haven't been able to see those things. I haven't been able to experience that healing, that hope, that grace that you keep talking about. I'm still without a job. We're still dealing with infertility. My prodigal son and daughter, they're still not home yet. Then what? What do I do now? Here's what you do. You keep doing what Rudy did. <laughs> you keep on keeping on. You keep believing and you keep trying and you keep praying and you keep asking God and you keep running to the Father who loves you and has arms outstretched open wide for you. And you experience in a way that only He can give you a peace that passes understanding. And I know we use that phrase a lot, but this is exactly what it means. Uh, a piece that says, even though everything is not settled in my life, I know that I'm settled because of whose I am. I'm settled because of who it is that holds me in his hands. When I was getting ready for that and I used that phrase, holds me in his hands, it reminded me of a song that I used to sing when I was a kid at home with my mom and dad. Maybe you guys remember this. You remember that song? He's got the whole world. Good. You thought, I thought the worship through song portion was over. Oh, no, it's coming back. Right? <laughs> I thought about that. It, and, man, when you were a kid, we used to sing all the verses. He's got the, 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 the in his hand. You know, he's got all the things he just have in his hands. And, and I thought about that today, and I thought, how fitting that is for us in, in this moment. This fitting realization that he still holds your whole world in his hands. Remember, I want to ask you to write some things down. What are those problems? What are those challenges, those obstacles? I want you to come back to those right now. You know those things you listed on your app or on your notes or on your hand or on your neighbor's hand? Guess what? He still got all those problems, all those struggles, all those challenges still in his hands. I think it sounds a little something like this. Maybe your problem was the economy. He's got the American economy in his hands. Or for some of you, you're thinking, he's got the sleazy politicians in his hands. <laughs> it's too true, Keith, too true. Maybe, maybe for you, it's a friend, right? He's got my buddy who just lost his job and his truck won't start and his dog ran away and now it's a country song. See what we did there? Isn't that good, right? <laughs> in his hands. I wonder what would happen if we really did personalize it this morning. You, you know what I would sing? He's got my mama with dementia in his hands. He does. He's got that prodigal son and daughter and the financial hurt and the marriage that seems so broken and hopeless. 
He's got all of that firmly in his hands. And when God's word says, and you can know, you can know that not in spite of all the problems, but actually because of these problems, God says, watch me work. It looks impossible, but I am the God of the impossible, and I will never waste a hurt. You'll never be abandoned. You'll never be neglected. And sure, it may not work out just the way you think it should, but you can trust me that I've got your whole world in my hands. That's where peace and hope and comfort come from. You can know that you know that you know no matter what it is that's on your paper or on your notes are the very same thing that your heavenly Father holds firmly in His hands. And not in spite of, but because of that pain and struggle and challenge, He will use that as a catalyst for a God-directed outcome you cannot even imagine or dream of. This next part's not anything I was planning, but I couldn't help as I was thinking and, and praying for it tonight. A little later, Paul talks to another group of Christ followers in one of his other churches in Corinth, and he actually says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, all these things that I've dealt with, remember, this is not Paul sitting on the beach writing the Bible. This is Paul in prison. He, he says this, all these troubles, all these hardships, all these difficulties, he says these are light and momentary troubles. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't consider prison a light and momentary trouble. Do you? But he says this, they're light and momentary troubles, and, and if that weren't enough, he says this, but they achieve for us an eternal glory which far outweighs them all. In other words, Paul says, but I'm not looking at things just through this perspective. I'm looking through the perspective of a God who holds my world in his hands. And when it comes to that, he's not letting any problems or hurts be wasted. It's one of those things where he's taking them and working them all together because if we truly believe that God, the God of the universe, will continue the work that he has started, then what in the world do we have to fear? We can trust that even in the pain, even in the challenge, even in the struggle, he is at work. So we're going to end things a little differently today. And here's what I'm going to invite you to do. We're going to stand right here and right now. Come on, everyone, stand to your feet. You're online, Peru. Come on, stand with us right now. And I'm not going to bring uh, the praise team back up today. We're going to rock this thing a cappella. You ready? <laughs> We're actually going to sing that song together. And I want you to sing it like you would have sang it with your kid with reckless abandon. Sometimes we're a little too cautious about what people around us may think. My friends, this is not a chance for us for like a choir audition. This is us in our chance to proclaim the truth that we heard today that we can know and we can keep knowing that whatever problems, whatever troubles, whatever struggles come, there's a God who holds them in his hands and he is at work doing something in them that is far beyond anything we could ever imagine, okay? So ready? And when we sing, you hold, our, we, he's got the whole world in his hands, I want you to think about what are those things on that paper that he is holding in your hands right now. That marriage struggle, that financial difficulty, that health scare, whatever it is, that's what he's holding, okay? All right. Now we're going to sing it like we mean it, okay? Ready? He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. Okay, great. And that's the truth, that he's got your whole world in his hands, and you can know that you know that you know that he'll never waste a hurt or that problem or that pain. Would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you for your word that we can keep on knowing that you've got this. There's no problem, there's no pain, there's no challenge that surprises you. You've never looked at our lives and said, I didn't see that coming. You see and know everything. <laughs> You're a God that says, not in spite of, but because of this pain, because of this challenge, because of this struggle, I'm gonna do something that you can't even begin to possibly imagine. And if it can happen for a guy in prison, and that prison resulted in boldness and confidence and spreading of your word, then Lord, we're gonna trust you in the midst of our pains and struggles that you'll never waste a hurt and that you'll walk with us and lead us and guide us. That's the confidence that we're going to have in your word and in your promises, and that's the peace we're going to experience, even in the midst of the storm. 
Lord Jesus, we believe you for it all. We ask it in your name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Hey, before you take off today, here's what I need you to do. Turn to your neighbor and tell him he's got your whole world in his hands. And I'll see you next week. That was a great message, wasn't it? When you were talking about or thinking about what does God have in his hands, would you just stick a note to our host and tell them, hey, this is what I was saying in that song. He's got whatever in his hands. I hope that you have grown closer to Jesus. I hope that you know him better and know his plan for you. Have a great week. We'll see you back here next weekend.